You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, welcome to another spectacular episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Pablo. <laughs> and I'm just Rob. And this is episode number six. What is this? 665. Thank you, guys. Rob, a.k.a. Thug Nasty. Thug Nasty. That only happens when the hat goes. It only happens when he drives into the parking lot with his hat on backwards and he's driving the Suburban with gangster rims. Yeah. Because he does have one of Paul those. Paul is convinced <laughs> that we have gangster rims on you my, do. On my you family do. car. <laughs> <laughs> you have black 20 inch rims on your freaking suburban <laughs> and it's not like he got it done for any particular reason it was just you bought the car like that right oh yeah well yeah i wouldn't buy them and I'm not into that it that's was just... not that's not your financial mo no no it definitely is not Couldn't yo i'm gonna less. get a suburban i'm gonna spend like five grand on rims <laughs> no that's not that's not us that's not me no, it's not me either. I, I try to keep things factory on the car because they I do too, tend actually. to last longer. I actually prefer that. Um, but anyways, that didn't happen in this particular case. It's okay, Thug Nasty. <laughs> Sweet. Well, let's get into today's question. It's actually going to be a deep one. We're going to be getting all kinds of scientific. We're going to philosophize. We're going to talk about deep scientific things. We're going we're gonna to make America Don't great leave again. us. I think it'll be good. No, I say think it, scientific things. We might lose some people. No, if you, if this is where the the industry is going. This is where, yeah. uh, and I'm glad I learned about this stuff five years ago. Um, but this is this is where the money is because if you wanna if you wanna do more than just fly and film, and you really want to make a career and support a family and build a retirement fund and pay for health care, or not, I don't know. The health care thing's up to you. Um, I think you're gonna want to hear this question, which is brought to you by. Mm, brought to you by our friends at videoblocks.com forward slash drone. Guys, if you've ever been on a project, I know Paul's been in the situation where he's done a project, been out filming, gets back, and even Paul, if mm. I may say so, mm. gets back and realizes, crap, I didn't get X Damn. shot. Or, Damn. man, I really needed this B-roll that I did not get. Mother effer. Or I have this particular, yeah, that, there's a lot of that actually. <laughs> or there's a particular sound I'm looking for. Well, you know what? Just head to videoblocks.com or audioblocks.com. And by the way, if you go to that videoblocks.com slash drone, you're going to get both for 149 bucks. Check it out. It's a really good option for a lot of you guys out there putting these videos together. You know, you said something that actually uh, I've been doing a lot of audio sound bits recently because I realized just how much they're used in cable television. And so like I did this, um, I, I really wanted to showcase kind of the ocean vibe of wake surfing and I needed some, some pelicans hmm. literally like I'm pretty sure I can pull up the video right now. Surf how there you go. Surf how you want. Give me the video surf how you want. And it literally Nope, that that's not the right one. That's the Instagram edit. Um, but it literally starts out with pelicans. Hmm. Let's see if I got the pelicans in here. Yeah, so you might um, be out shooting and, and the birds are not cooperating. They're sleeping. Yeah, they're, it's not the morning. You can't hear that. Whoa, whoa. Here we go. So you wanted the sound? Is that what you I wanted? I wanted the sound, yeah. Oh, okay. Here, play this thing. Play that. Before you fall asleep on us, we'll get back to the show. <laughs> Play the question, Rob. <laughs> okay. Hey, guys. My name is Ryan, and I just uh, got a 90% this morning on the 107 thanks to your program. I have a couple quick questions about um, some of the competition I have around my area in the state uh, that I'm going to be building my business in. There's a lot of multispectral, hyperspectral, uh, thermal mapping light detection and ranging with, I guess, some lasers that they use. Uh, I'm not too familiar with this, and I'm still learning all about it. I was wondering if you guys have uh, had any experience with this and how lucrative it may be. 
I realize there's probably a lot more equipment I'm going to have to buy as well as software um, to get into this. But if you guys could give me, you know, just a brief explanation of some of it or what, what's worked for you guys, I'd really appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Um, this question is a little deeper. I love those and deep it questions. Definitely, definitely can be lucrative. We know that. Um, and it, you're definitely going to have to spend some money. Definitely. Um, in fact, I feel like one of the most lucrative jobs right now is mapping with LiDAR systems. But in order to get um, below the accuracy of what photogrammetry can do, you're definitely spending 100 grand on a drone. Uh, and if that's probably 80 grand on the sensor. But um, let's talk a little bit about these sensors. Let's talk about what they do, and let's talk about the practical jobs that you can get from these sensors. So LiDAR is uh, light detection and ranging. That's literally what it stands for. And LiDAR is really used in mapping complex objects, complex uh, arenas, complex areas. But it's also used in pipeline and gas line inspection. It's really, really powerful for seeing cracks in pipelines, especially oil pipelines. So if you're flying a vehicle like that, chances are you are charging a few hundred dollars a minute to fly it. Uh, I'm wow. not exaggerating. There's someone here in Albuquerque doing that right now. Uh, that's not me, but um, I, I could tell you who it is. But I'm not going to because I don't like the guy. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, but it is very, very valuable. Um, you may want to look at a fixed wing drone to fly that. The Silent Falcon is a very good drone for that. Again, you're talking 100 grand for the drone, but when you can make hundreds of dollars a minute, you tend to make that cost up significantly uh, and rather quickly. Let's talk about multispectral sensor. So even if you Google multispectral sensor or hyperspectral sensor, you really don't get the official, uh, how do I say this, the official technical term, the definition of what it really is. So multispectral sensor is essentially looking at multiple bands of light. That's how I want you to remember, multispectral, multiple bands of light. But what it's doing is it's using filters to filter out every single band of light that is not specific to what you're looking for. So multispectral sensors are looking for the specific reflectivity and absorbance of light to give you specific information. Now, multispectral sensors are used significantly in agriculture to do disease prevention and control. It's also used to see how healthy plants are by looking for specific elements in those plants. And people also use multispectral sensing in mining. It's actually more like hyperspectral sensing, but... When you're looking for multiple things on the surface, multispectral sensors can be very helpful. Um, if you're using multispectral sensors, chances are you're working in agriculture. Um, and if you are working in agriculture, I would recommend something like the Precision Hawk uh, system. They've got an entire, um, it, I mean, it is an end to end solution. You can buy a multispectral sensor. But how is your client going to visualize the data? How are they going to interpret the data? And how are they going to take actions on the data? What Precision Hawk does is it provides you with a drone. It's a Lancaster drone and a multispectral sensor. They actually set the camera up to look for what you want to look for. But they also give you a back-end solution to process that data to create uh, maps with the multispectral stuff, the multispectral images. And they index that data so that your clients can also view that data on the back end. Now, for Precision Hawk, again, you're looking in the fifty to hundred thousand dollar range. And a lot of people have said to me they're not firm believers in Precision Hawk. I kind of question those people who have said that because I think it's one of the best end-to-end -end solutions. But again, unless you're in agriculture or mining or discovery um, or oil discovery, probably not for you. Now, hyperspectral sensors, I call the hyperspectral sensor, and the way that you can remember it is looking for a needle in a haystack. It is the one thing that I think that we could find Forrest Fenn's treasure with here in New Mexico, Rob. <laughs> hey. I'm serious. I believe you. I know you're serious. So, And I actually found out what that treasure chest is made out of. So as soon as we get our hands on one, I know we're going out to Pilar, and we're going to go fly some mapping missions. Hmm. So, Does he have rules, or does it... I don't give a if he has rules. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just curious. I'm not remember asking the, if I'm not asking if you care why, about why how what thing we were doing with our coach and my whole how was challenge the status quo. There you go. Okay. The question was not do you care whether or not there are rules. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, carry okay, on. Okay, so hyperspectral sensor is a needle in a haystack. And I talk about this in my book, Living the Drone Life, which is on Amazon. If you pick one up, uh, please leave me a review. I would love to uh, see what you think about that. But a hyperspectral sensor is literally having the availability to find a needle in a haystack. Why? Because you are only looking for one specific band of light. You're looking for that band of light based off of one specific uh, reflectivity and one specific set of absorbency. So every single chemical... Um, every single, how do I say this? Uh, I'm not finding the right word here. Scientists are going to kill me right now. Um, every single particle, every single thing like, um, copper versus, um, plastic versus polycarbonates versus, um, I'm trying to think lead. They all have different rates of absorbency and reflectivity. So if you can set your hyperspectral camera to look for your wife's turquoise ring on a beach riddled with minerals, you will literally be able to see nothing in the camera but turquoise. So hmm. it is a very cool technology. It is how you find a needle in a haystack. It is also how a lot of oil agencies are looking for oil. They're looking for humates. They're looking for um, different things uh, on the ground to tell them what's below to see if it is a hydrocarbon rich area to do drilling and oil, uh, essentially, exploration. It's really cool, all the different things. I'm even noticing here that LiDAR is being, it's a, one of the main technologies behind driverless cars. Oh, yeah, 100%. Velodyne cool. is actually uh, the, the main manufacturer of that. And we are trying to um, get a bird in the air that can fly a Velodyne unit. But the issue is that the lower end Velodyne unit only has an accuracy of two centimeters um, per pixel, which as a ground sampling distance is not very accurate. Interesting. So... You really have to dig into this stuff super, super deep. And I'm hoping that we can do classes on it in the future um, because there is a lot of money in exploration. There is a lot of money in pipeline inspection. There is a lot of money in oil rig inspections. Um, but they take very specific drones. And for example, if you're doing oil offshore oil rig inspections, you've got to have drones that are spark proof. You've got to have... Um, there are levels and levels of nuances that uh, you would have to be prepared for. So if you want to take on those challenges, if that really excites you, I would love to hear from you. And I think it's, I think it's a very cool, interesting uh, field to get into. And uh, it's, It is deep stuff, though. It's... It is deep stuff, but if you go into it, I mean, this is the type of stuff that DARPA is using mm -hmm. to develop new um, platforms, new vehicles. Uh, it is the wave of the future. Um, it all, you know, it's funny because someone once told me they love their Tesla because it's got autopilot on it, but I would never trust autopilot because it's based off of stereoscopic sensors, hmm. which is essentially two visual cameras. Um, I would trust it if it was based off of LiDAR. Interesting. So not radar, LIDAR. So, Which, and I know more about radar now because of our hush-hush contract that I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are various ways to go about this. And so there's kind of, it's cool. I mean, there's a competition ultimately going on, but obviously LIDAR seems to be taking the lead with self-driving cars. So It is. You can even get an RP LIDAR sensor um, on a drone, which RP LIDAR is only, I think, 500 bucks on Amazon. But you've got to learn how to program a little computer uh, to actually process that data. Your drone cannot process that data on its own. If you do have an M600, there is the, um, oh, I forget the name of the DJI unit. I think it might be called the DJI module, but it's essentially a secondary onboard computer that can process that data and store that data so you can actually get um, uh, the, the data on the point cloud from the LiDAR. So, wow. Yeah, I mean, Crazy if you stuff. actually think about what's in driverless cars, I do think that we're a few years out just because I don't believe that the processing power is there yet because essentially LiDAR is creating a point cloud. The software is reading the point cloud. And in my, um, how do I say this, experience of using radar and LiDAR and point clouds, I don't think that many of these programs can even handle the speed at which that is necessary to do complex uh, operating environments. Which makes the vehicles too expensive for the market. Yes. Because you could you could make it happen, but now you've got a, whatever, I don't know, $200,000 car. You remember that computer we priced out? 
Yeah. It would probably have to be three or four of those. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like it's not going to work. 40 grand. Not the market's not going to accept that, but not yet. It's coming. It definitely is coming. And like all things in technology, we'll, we will grow, we will scale, we will have faster and faster things for cheaper and cheaper prices. So Interesting. Um, it's funny. Uh, what is that? Elon Musk has repeatedly pushed the idea that if humans can perceive and navigate the world using just eyes, ears, and a brain, then why can't a car? Mm. Elon, you're a cool <laughs> dude, but <laughs> well, uh, let me let me just put it this way: I'm not going to tell him he can't do it. No, right? Me, me neither. <laughs> so, but how do you put intuition in a vehicle? Yeah, because there are times. Like well, how do you morning, put intuition in a 16-year-old? My son's about to start driving. I might take the computer over that. And well, like there are times like this morning where an old man is on his phone and I, I hate old people, young people, middle-aged people. If you're on your phone and you're driving, you're threatening someone's life and I am going to let you know about it on the road. So I'm not going to be aggressive, but I am going to literally pull up next to you and rail on my horn and let you know that I don't like the idea that you're threatening my life and the people around us. But um, intuition, for example, is when someone pulls out and they're on their phone and they don't really are able to accurately gauge the speed that you're going and you have to aggressively speed up to actually avoid an accident. That's what I mean about intuition. Most people don't know that if you are driving over 35 miles an hour, you should actually speed up to avoid an accident, not slow down. You will learn this information if you attend the BMW Driving School in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Boy, going all kinds of directions in this podcast. Well, you always say how I'm super analytical when I drive, and it's true. Oh, my gosh. I, there, I defy you to find somebody else who is more <laughs> of an analytical driver. Than... <laughs> and some people think I'm aggressive. And literally last night I was on the phone with an APD officer, and I'm like, I just watched three people go through. And this is my friend. I wasn't ratting these people out. But I was like, I just watched three people run a red light because they were on their phone. And I said, I wish police officers would seriously ticket every single person who goes on their phone and let speeders go. Because if you're speeding Hmm. and you're not aggressively speeding, I mean, like you're speeding, you're like 15 over the speed limit and you're not aggressively changing lanes. You're just in a hurry. You tend to be more perceptive. You tend to be more observant. And when you're on your phone, you're less observant. Oh, significantly. Honestly, I yeah. just I want to be a cop for a week to just create a YouTube series with how I pull people over for being on their phones and, and make fun of people. Mm. And be like, I, I are you, you making fun of me, Meow? Do I look like a, a kitty jumping from tree to tree on Nimbly Bimbly? <laughs> I have a feeling you'd get in trouble <laughs> <laughs> if, if they allowed that. I'm sure I would, but I'd sure love to. Anyways, Ryan, you're getting more than you bargained for with this question, but hopefully <laughs> hopefully it's been helpful. It's it's always an education to me, actually, to hear Paul talk about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I love um I love hyperspectral sensors and I wish I could have my, get my hands on one to to do a class on it because I think that um you know, this goes back to like what I learned in school. The human eye can really only see about one percent of all light. And with these other sensors, we can see about 30% of all light. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, it is cool. And what's really cool is the technology that's coming out of that capability. True. So so think about this. If we can only see 1% of all light, then how do you know that there's not an alien in this room right now? (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) I don't smell anything. You smell kind of weird. I don't hear anything. That's the copy machine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, guys, that's going to do it for us today. If you found this episode useful or valuable, please leave us a review or share the show. Do us a favor, please. Especially if you're not a member. If you are a member, thank you so much for the support. We greatly appreciate it. And if you're not a member and you want to support the show, becoming a member is a great way to do it because you get a lot deeper information and a lot more of it. And it's on demand whenever you want it. So check it out, thedroneu.com. That's going to do it for us today. My name is Paul. My name is Rob. This is Ask Drone You. (laughs) 